Boldwood presents When We Were Friends, written by Samantha Tong and read by Claire Storey. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue, June 2004 Having checked that no one had followed her there, Morgan stood at the back end of Dalesworth High, by the hazel tree that grew next to the hidden basement door. To her mother's horror, no frills Morgan had insisted on wearing a tux to the prom. She adjusted the bow tie her dad had fastened and glanced down at the smart black jacket. Morgan was more used to seeing the vertical rows of metallic school achievement badges down her bottle green blazer's lapels when she stood on the school grounds. Untended plants sprawled across the ground and climbed the cracked windows of the disused science lab. Glad to never have to suffer the stuffiness of classrooms again, she breathed in the smell of woody soil. A sprig of her spiky short hair stuck defiantly in the air as she consulted the clock on her mum's old flip phone. With her confident stride, Paige was the first friend to arrive, her rusty red salon hair stylishly covering the top of her slinky white halter neck dress. The silky material almost reached the ground and was cut to show off her bare upper back. The two girls gave each other a side hug. Next, Emily appeared like a rabbit from the undergrowth, paused, moved forwards, and then stopped again. Morgan and her friends had gone shopping to Debenhams in Manchester to buy their outfits for the prom. Their mums had joined them, apart from Emily's, who'd been ill for over a year and wasn't up to it. Emily loved knitting, and the girls had teased that she'd make her own woolly outfit. However, she fell in love with a baby blue dress. It had polka dots and was retro 50s style, going down to her knees. She'd ignored her outgoing mother's advice to get something that showed off her legs and cleavage. Morgan drew Emily in for an embrace, whilst Paige playfully pulled on her high ponytail. The four of them had been looking forward to the prom for weeks, getting dressed up, seeing how their teachers danced, and the sleepover at Paige's afterwards. Yesterday, Morgan, Emily and Tiff had dropped off their overnight bags at her house. Tiff turned up last, running as her cheeks billowed in and out with puffs of humid air. Her pace slowed and she sashayed up the last steps, almost tripping as she bowed to imaginary fans at her sides. Tiff's mum insisted her daughter went f convinced that her one and only child was going to be a world-renowned actress. She almost passed out with delight when Tiff's curves fitted into the silver long fishtail covered in sequins. It was purple and matched her glasses. Tiff blew the other three girls' kisses, sparkly pink lip gloss marks left on her fingers. Together they brushed aside strategically placed branches on the ground to reveal the hidden door. Due to a mini heat wave over the last week, the ground and fallen leaves were bone dry, so the girls ran no risk of dirtying their fancy clothes. Paige and Tiff heaved it up. Emily checked around before following the others in. Climbing down, the four of them chatted about the evening ahead and whether anyone would sneak in alcohol. Emily closed the door behind herself as Morgan switched on the torch they always left by the bottom of the steps. The school's old basement, run down and forgotten, smelt of mould and crawled with spiders that didn't scare these teenagers. The last meeting ever, of the Secret Gift Society, said Morgan, a voice sounding full and unexpectedly trembling. It's been a lifesaver, said Emily. I don't know how I'd have got through this last year without you four. Her face was tinged pink. You're the best. More like sisters. I wish we were all going to the same sixth form, mumbled Tiff. It's scary, the thought of having to make new friends, right? It's hard to imagine another group of girls understanding me like you lot do. But we'll still see each other out of lessons, said Morgan, back to her usual steady self. She did breaststroke in the air, and the others smiled and followed the gesture. 
It was inspired by Finding Nemo, one of their favourite movies, even though the target audience was much younger. In it, Dory the fish said to keep on swimming however tough life became. Something tells me we'll never lose our friendship. It'll always be there, like a favourite book, even if we lose touch on and off, said Paige, and she laid her head on Morgan's shoulder. Love you guys, said Tiff. Here's to a great night, until I get home, that is. I spotted a plastic tiara Mum's bought. I overheard her saying to Dad that when I get home, she's going to crown me prom queen. Oh, it's so cringy. You know, she bumped into... Tiff stopped abruptly. What? asked Emily. It doesn't matter. Tiff? the other girls chorused. Red blotches appeared on Tiff's neck. It's nothing. Just that Mum bumped into... He was boasting about how his son is bound to be voted prom king. Silence fell. Morgan's friends all looked uncomfortable, but then Hugo was the boy the four of them hated with a passion. Paige consulted her watch. Come on, let's do this, for the very last time, for old time's sake. With a shy look, Emily was the first to stretch out her arms, dark rings under her eyes. The girls stood in a circle and linked hands, fingers intertwined, Morgan clenching the torch under one arm. As the words came out, loud and proud, their voices synced and sent echoes along the dingy walls of the basement. The secret gift society swears through its blood to only act for the good. Its four powers to serve those in need of defence all hail. As the last line of their oath listed each of their gifts, it also reached the smirk of the smartly dressed boy hiding behind the hazel tree. Those losers have no idea I'm going to tear apart their so-called friendship at the prom tonight, he muttered. They're going to get everything they deserve. Chapter One Morgan Morgan sat at the kitchen table in pyjamas, unaware she was shivering. The heating had gone off hours ago. When she'd gone up to bed, the door of his room had been left ajar. Ollie must have slipped out after their argument. And breathe, she told herself. He'd only been missing a matter of hours. Yet it was three in the morning, and this was unprecedented behaviour. she just picked up her phone to ring the police when the front door clicked. Morgan jumped up and ran into the hallway, heady relief making her stumble at the sight of the sticky-up chestnut hair she herself had had at his age, and at the lean frame that was so like his grandfather's. Why haven't you picked up my calls? Where were you? Out, he replied with a deadpan face. Ollie, her voice broke. It's freezing outside. I was at a friend's house, okay, he muttered. Vikram's coming over after physics tomorrow. Don't say anything embarrassing. Arms open, she moved towards him, but he stepped away. You can't go off like that, love. Not answering your phone. But let's talk about it. What's the point, Mum, when you won't even give me his name? Still this. Like I said, you're better off without your dad in your life. I don't know what I ever saw in him. Anyway, he left Dalesworth before you were born, and he could be anywhere in the world by now. You never even told him. I was sixteen. I didn't know myself until it was too late to find him. I did try, but he'd already moved away. She reached out and touched Ollie's arm. He shook her off. It's taken me so long to understand and come to terms with who I am to feel that sense of calm and relief. The words came out of his mouth with a tremble. But there's still this, the final piece of the puzzle. To know myself completely, I need to know my dad. But it's shit, you refusing to tell me, still treating me like a child. Don't speak to me like that, young man. Ollie kicked off his muddy boots. Yes, I'll officially be a man in February when I turn 18. Yet you won't even trust me with the smallest detail about him. Have you ever thought about how your silence affects me? 
like my sense of shame because you hate the person who made the other half of me, as if there must be something wrong with me too. There is nothing wrong with you. Don't ever think that. I just, it's a shame I've carried my whole life, with teachers and friends asking about my father, it looking as if I'm worthless for having a dad who didn't want to stick around. His voice faltered. When I was little, I couldn't understand why I didn't have one like my best friends did. I pretend mine was an astronaut. I'd say he was away, busy discovering new planets. I almost believed it myself. Yeah, in bed at night, I'd ask myself what if he did know about me after all? What if mum's lying and I was really rejected? A son who wasn't good enough for his own father? He threw his hands in the air. I'm sick of all these questions flying around my head and I intend to get answers one way or another. He shouted the last sentence. A lump rose in Morgan's throat. If she told Ollie his dad's name, that would be the beginning, not the end. There'd be more and more questions. She'd have to relive that terrible time. And then there was the matter of protecting her son. Who knew what sort of person his cruel, conniving father had turned into? Ollie had demanded to know two years ago, in a much more determined way than he ever had before. A girl in his year had got pregnant. She was sixteen, like Morgan had been. It brought it all back, and she'd wondered if Ollie heard her sobbing in her bedroom, after their argument, as he hadn't mentioned the subject of his father again so forcefully until now. Keep your voice down, Ollie, you'll wake the neighbours. I don't care, he hollered. You're practically a grown-up now, act like it, she snapped. Why won't, he said and glared. I've a right to know, and if you don't tell me, I'll be able to do what I want to find out as soon as my next birthday is here. She opened her mouth and closed it again. Do you know what it's been like to have been born on Valentine's Day, he said. It's as if the universe is laughing at me every year. What with my parents' romance being over before I was even born. Her eyes pricked. Yes, she'd always felt that and had always hoped that her son hadn't. Ollie stormed upstairs, leaving her standing in the hallway, feeling numb. Ollie's back, that's the main thing. She whispered to herself as she walked into the kitchen and slumped into one of the wooden slat back chairs. Since her son had come out to her about his sexuality, she'd hoped they'd become closer again. On bonfire night, when he'd got back from a night with his friends, he'd blurted it out and the two of them had sat on the sofa until dawn, talking in a way they hadn't for ages, about love and boys and his fears and hopes for the future. But instead, the opposite had happened, and now Ollie hardly spoke to her. His bedroom door slammed, and a framed photo toppled over on the scratched Welsh dresser, onto her Best Employee of the Month certificate. She'd often received them, and had lost count of the times management had asked her to become a supervisor. It would mean more pay, more responsibility, but less time to dedicate to Ollie. Morgan picked up the photo of the two of them on a beach. He was six. They'd made a stick man in the sand, out of washed-up driftwood, and, as if it were an Olympic torch, he proudly held an ice cream with a chocolate flake in the top. She ran her thumb over his little face. Had that boy felt rejected, despite the love she'd smothered him with? A sunny June day came to mind when he'd been in primary school. Every year, the teachers organised a Father's Day event. Ollie's grandfather, Morgan's dad, couldn't get the day off work, so his great-granddad, in his late sixties, went in instead. When they got home, Ollie was very quiet. He opened up to Morgan later. He did in those days. Everyone else's dad had played in the football match, but what with his bad hip, Ollie's great-granddad couldn't. Oh, they had fun crafting, but Ollie had wanted to play football. It hadn't helped when one of the boys teased that he'd done a girl's activity. Morgan switched off the lights and trudged upstairs. She pulled open the bottom drawer by the side of her bed 
rummaging before she took out a sheaf of homemade cards with misshapen flowers and hearts with phrases such as best friend mummy and love you more than Teddy. When he wasn't slamming doors, Ollie was a reliable, caring lad who visited his grandparents and helped with the washing up. He mowed the small lawn out the back without being asked and never forgot his mum's birthday. She went to the window and gazed up at the moon. It had been full the night Ollie was born. Mum had held her hand throughout the labour, unaware Morgan wished it was her three best friends, Paige, Emily and Tiff, who were there. They would have made jokes, said Morgan deserved an achievement badge to go with her others. Emily would have knitted clothes for the baby. Morgan shook her head as she recalled the horrible words the four of them had shouted at each other when the shocking truths came out at the end of year 11, when Morgan was in the early stage of pregnancy without knowing it. Yet the hurtful comments hadn't stopped her wishing they'd been there to talk to. Not just on the day she had Ollie, but also on that rainy afternoon in the dirty public toilet in Manchester when she'd done a pregnancy test. Even now, Morgan still missed the other three, especially at Christmas. Paige's parents used to throw a fancy party, and the four of them would laugh at the word amuse bouche before scoffing far too many. And even though she never won, because the others liked board games, Emily would organise a festive-themed session, which made Scrabble take even longer than usual. Tiff always landed a role in the school play, partly to please her parents, and also because she enjoyed the buzz of the stage. The other three would cheer loudly at the sidelines, whereas Morgan would make them each a bag of fudge, classic plain for Paige, candy cane with sprinkles for Emily, and for Tiff, chocolate peanut butter. Her phone pinged, and she tapped into her emails. No, she didn't want to enter a prize draw to win a five million pound house. Gambling was a mugs game. A second new email caught her eye, this one from Dalesworth High. The subject line said, Last call for alumni news. Today was Friday 15th of December. In exactly one month's time, the yearly email newsletter from her old school would arrive. It always came in the middle of January and contained a summary of the previous 12 months, along with hopes for those coming. She and her best friends hadn't been bothered about receiving it, but a few weeks before the prom, their English teacher had insisted the whole class sign up, said they'd be glad when they were older. Every January since leaving, Morgan had read up on the changes and achievements at her mother, the deaths of favourite teachers, a new library built, the successes of sports teams, a report on an alumni get-together every summer, although she never attended it. Of course, unlike for Paige, Emily and Tiff, not all the news would be new to Morgan, as she'd stayed in Dalesworth and her son had attended their old high school until he'd gone to sixth form college nearly two years ago. Letting go of her phone, Morgan dozed. Her stomach took its time to unfurl after Ollie's return. At 35 years old now, surely Paige, Emily and Tiff wouldn't still hold a grudge? Her anger against them had mellowed a long time ago, and now and then she'd been tempted to reach out. She'd even searched for them on social media once, but with no luck. Perhaps they used married names now. They were just silly teenagers at the time of their spectacular argument, the summer before Ollie was born. Nineteen years later, she'd loved to meet them. A wish that had magnified since October, one weekend when Ollie was away on a field trip. She'd had to call out an ambulance in the middle of the night with acute chest pains. To her embarrassment, a bad case of indigestion. She got back from hospital before he arrived the next day and was going to tell him about it, but he'd returned in such a black mood. When Ollie opened up on bonfire night, she found out he and his friends had played truth or dare on that October trip and he'd been teased by his friends for avoiding the opportunity to kiss one of the girls. So, at that point, she'd decided not to open up to Ollie about the night in A&E, 
that had pushed her one step closer to accepting he needed to be in touch with his dad, because if something happened to her, he'd be left without a parent. But more than that, what if Ollie disappeared again? Despite the years that had passed, Paige, Emily and Tiff were the only people she could think of in the world who could help her find her son's dad. Ollie might run away and not come back, go on some madcap mission to find his father himself. Her stomach knotted again at the thought. The Secret Gift Society was her only hope. That A&E visit had also made her think about the rift at high school and how badly such important friendships had ended, how the four of them might laugh affectionately now about the secret society they'd formed that had tracked down lost calculators, revealed bullies to teachers, found out which pupil was stealing dinner money. They could never resist a challenge. Now more than ever she wanted those three friends back in her life. Oh, she went bowling or out to eat, thanks to work, and met... But she'd never built friendships like those three at school. What if something happened to one of them before they all made up? What if one of them had already passed? Morgan sat up and reached for her bedside water. Was there any chance they could become friends again, reform the society, and solve the mystery of Ollie's father's whereabouts? Could she send a message to them in the next newsletter? No. Stupid idea. A fantasy. Yet. Arranging to meet her old friends, digging up the past. Some might say neither of those ideas were sensible. However, Morgan had become sick of that word. After so much of her youth had been spent changing nappies and missing nights out, doing a job that didn't inspire her, never getting hung over. This once, it wouldn't hurt for her to do something wild, would it? Her bus to work drove past Dalesworth High every day, and on Saturday morning she saw parents standing in the field, cheering on their children playing football. The four friends, former friends, could easily slip past and head to the old science block, to their old secret meeting place. It might remind the others of the fun times they once shared. Morgan put down the glass and tapped into her phone. Her first weekend day off, after the newsletter would go out in January, was a Saturday in February, not long after Ollie turned 18. She exhaled. Would his questions wait until then? With mock exams looming, she had to hope he'd be too wrapped up with studies to focus on finding his dad, and meeting the others in February might bring answers quickly enough. The four of them always used to work so well together. At seven, Morgan showered, got dressed into her lime-green supermarket uniform, and set about making her packed lunch that every day consisted of a sandwich cut in half, one apple, and a multi-pack chocolate wafer. Order, routine. Such had been her life since giving birth. Sequencing was important in maths to get the correct answer, in life, too, she used to reckon. Teenage Morgan had her sequence all worked out. She'd achieve her goal of leaving behind her life in Dalesworth, would go to university and then travel, before settling down as a maths teacher. A far cry away from the life of her cashier and warehouse manager parents who'd unexpectedly had her in their teens. Yet here Morgan was, working in the same supermarket as her mum, still on the council estate where she'd grown up. The sequence of her life had simply echoed that of... She gave a wry smile. Teenage Morgan often used to make comparisons to maths. The other three would tease her about it. Shall I make your favourite tonight, love, for you and Vic Cram? Morgan asked in a bright voice as Ollie stood in the hallway with his rucksack. I can thaw out some chicken. Or how about pizza? The supermarket has got a special offer on for staff at the moment and... Stop fussing, Mum. We'll sort ourselves out, he said with a rare shot of eye contact. Morgan stiffened as she placed a halved sandwich in her lunchbox. After the front door had closed, she went to the kitchen window. Oh, Ollie had grown in height and needed to shave now, 
and very often only answered with a grunt, but he still went down the street with that enthusiastic bounce, still smiled at strangers. She could tell by their faces as they walked past him. Ollie was a good lad. He deserved every happiness. He wasn't going to grow out of needing to know his dad, like he'd grown out of the Harry Potter fancy dress outfit she'd saved up ages for. She went back onto her phone and into the email about the last call for alumni news, fingers poised to start typing. However, instead, she washed up the breakfast dishes, cleaned her teeth and put on her coat. The others probably felt exactly like her. What idiots they'd been to fall out because of that creep Hugo Black. She imagined her friends living in big, detached houses, enjoying holidays abroad and shopping trips without a budget, in some fancy market town or by the coast. They must have all moved away because she'd never bumped into them during all this time. However, she wouldn't swap Dalesworth for Dubai if having a fancy life had meant she'd never had Ollie. Morgan's phone pinged. Pizza sounds good. Ollie's way of saying sorry. She'd never taken Ollie to Disneyland. His laptop wasn't as flash as his friends, and his sports trainers came from the bargain store. When he was younger, none of these things mattered. He'd had a happy childhood. Her love filled the gaps. But things were different now. The days had gone when a hug and episode of Scooby-Doo would wave away his problems. Morgan went back to the email and tapped on reply. After several moments' thought, she typed out the sentence she wanted included in the next newsletter. T-S-G-S. Meet at the usual place. 10 a.m., 25th February. Hopefully her old friends would see it. A breath hitched. They had to. She went to a kitchen cupboard, took out her recipe book, and turned, dated in the 2000s, reminding herself of the ingredients she'd used nearer the time of meeting up. Of course, butter, sugar, condensed milk. A smile crossed her lips. Her friends were going to be so surprised. She grabbed her phone, pressed send, and as the email went off, gave a little jig, as if three bags of soft fudge could easily sweeten, nineteen hard-boiled years apart. Chapter 2. Paige, Emily, Tiff. Paige breathed in the subtle fragrance of cotton-fresh potpourri from the low, oblong table and balanced the laptop on her knees. She opened her inbox before reaching for her coffee. In a pinstriped trouser suit, she was perched on the white leather sofa and lifted her head to gaze through the windows at February clouds across the wide balcony and to the morning Manchester skyline. As usual, her husband, Felix, had left for work early, leaving her a period of quiet before her first client arrived after the rush hour. She worked hard, they both did, to maintain their luxury penthouse flat in the Castlefield area of Manchester. They'd bought it outright using his savings and the trust fund Paige's parents set up. She'd not had access to it until she turned 30, her mum and dad prioritised securing their daughter's future, but felt she needed to find her passions her own way first. They'd always had strong views about their daughter following her own destiny, and going to state school like they had, not private, mixing with pupils from all walks of life, about experiencing the satisfaction of reaching goals through hard work, not by being given leg-ups. Her eyes swept over the solid oak laminate floor and walls painted a shade called Digital Grey. It suited the curtains that, along with the lighting, thermostat and security cameras, could all be controlled remotely by smartphone. The two bedrooms were generously sized and the kitchen was open plan, with a vase of giant white daisies on one of the units. The ultimate luxury was a hot tub on the balcony a much-loved feature of Paige's. To check that she hadn't missed anything important, Paige scrolled back through emails from the last few weeks. Dalesworth High. 
She hadn't opened those newsletters for years. Her old teachers had probably left. With money from the local council or lottery funding, the school would have, no doubt, been made over beyond recognition. Paige didn't need details about class reunions. She'd never go, in case she... Yet, something told her to open this one. Paige put a manicured hand up to cover a yawn and half-heartedly read its first news item. No, it couldn't be true. Jasmine White was the new head teacher. She sat bolt upright, and an ache grew inside. As if they'd seen each other yesterday, she could picture her best friend's faces. Morgan rolling her eyes at this revelation, Emily doing her best to find the positives, and Tiff's overdramatic arms flailing in the air. Surrounded by her bitchy clique, popular Jasmine would follow them around at break, making kissing noises and asking if they'd ever had a boyfriend. They were mean to other pupils too, who didn't look up to the popular crew, but Jasmine especially enjoyed being cruel to Paige and her friends, perhaps because they succeeded in rarely showing that the insults bothered them. She said Morgan smelt like the sports changing rooms, and Emily had bat ears and every time they passed Tiff, she'd give a really loud oink. As for Paige, Jasmine would say she was a stuck-up cow who thought she was better than everyone else. In year seven, Jasmine had actually tried to make friends with Paige, but listening to her parents' stories, Paige had picked up how to spot people more interested in money than genuine friendship. So she'd ignored Jasmine's fawning comments about her clothes, her house, her parents' new car. Paige's eye swept over the rest of the newsletter, and she was about to close her inbox when a sentence caught her eye, mentioning a date in February. Paige focused intently on each word, and was still transfixed half an hour later when her first client rang the doorbell. She gave the sentence one last glance. Good grief. Good God. She got up and opened the door. Good morning, so very nice to see you. Emily snuggled into her wearable hooded blanket that smelt like it hadn't been washed since forever, making it even more appealing to her tortoiseshell cat Smudge, who slept on her lap. Scrolling down her phone, she saw the email from Dalesworth High. Curled up on the sofa, she glugged her mug of wine, hoping it would drown out the teenage boys outside throwing bang snaps. Even though it was now seven in the evening, she'd not been up long, having handed in her notice on New Year's Eve. She'd spent the days since catching up with the last couple of years' missed sleep, and Netflix too, plenty of takeout and a lifetime's worth of hangovers. She'd only just started checking emails again. It was the middle of February and six weeks since she the emergency care matron had phoned her the day after she'd left and insisted she take back her resignation. Emily had humoured her for the sick pay. Her first counselling session was due at the beginning of March. Waste of bloody time. She prepared to do the usual. Skim the school news and then delete. However, this time a name caught her eye and Emily gasped. Jasmine White, in charge. Back in her school days, Emily had done her best to find the good in the pupil every girl wanted to be, with her model figure and string of boyfriends, with her pinches, shoves and words that stung sharper than the nettles at the bottom of the sports field, away from the eyes and ears of teachers. Smudge listened as Emily told him all about her and the other three's old nemesis. Younger, naive Emily and scheming Jasmine, Stupid cows, the pair of them. Unable to stop herself, Emily read the whole article and studied the photo. The thin eyebrows had grown more straggly. The lips shone less brightly. The flowing mane of wavy hair was severely tied back. Smudge yawned. Emily couldn't leave it. Who'd ever have guessed Jasmine would lose her glamour? A warm sensation infused Emily, not because of the wine. She'd gone through a phase in year ten of having bad acne, and Jasmine would always offer her her concealer really loudly. 
Young Emily told herself she was just being helpful, despite Jasmine's laughter, despite Emily's own secret tears in the toilets. Emily sat very still as an acronym jumped into view. TSGS. What the? Was this a joke? Her heart pounded, and she couldn't breathe for a moment until, out of nowhere, a sob catapulted from her chest. Smudge jumped up and looked at her curiously. Wine tipped over the edge of her mug and onto the sleeve of the old stained jumper she'd knitted in happier times, sticking out from under her hooded blanket. Tears ran down her face as her whole body shuddered and memories fought their way through a haze of cheap Chardonnay. How she and her three friends used to practice kissing on pillows during sleepovers. Paige would give the others tips as she'd actually had experience, and Tiff was always the most enthusiastic, saying she'd need a good technique for her acting career. Then there was a silly dance they'd do to Hey Ya by Outcast, shaky shaking their bottoms. It was rare for them all to like the same piece of music. How they do baking at Morgan's and lick out the bowl, fighting over the wooden spoon, giggling as cake batter ended. Best of all, the excitement in the pit of Emily's stomach as they'd creep into the school basement and plan another investigation. The secret gift society had offered a total escape from her difficult mother, from bullies, from the general angst of adolescence. But then Hugo's image arrived, his smirking mouth telling everyone at the prom to be quiet. Then, as hush fell, he pointed to her, Morgan, Paige and Tiff. As his explosive revelations rang out, the girls turned angrily on each other. She'd never forgotten the humiliation dripping over her like a bottle of poisonous venom, soaking into every pore as the pupils gazed, jaws dropped at the four of them. It wasn't as if she could go home and be comforted by her mother, so Emily had stuffed her emotions down deep inside. Emily pushed the memories down again. She had enough problems in her current life without reliving ones from the past. A message for the secret gift society. She could do without Morgan's razor-sharp brain working out what a failure Emily had become. Or Paige, who was no doubt a millionaire by now with a luxury lifestyle and successful husband to match, smugly sympathising with Emily for her recent marriage breakup. As for Tiff, with her aspirations of fame and glamour, Emily's life couldn't be more diametric. Whichever of the others had called this stupid meeting in two weeks, they could F right off. Friday the 24th of February, and Tiff paced up and down in her old teenage bedroom. The discussion in her head wouldn't quieten down. A meeting had been called for tomorrow at her old school in that grotty basement. She'd read the Dalesworth High newsletter weeks ago and was still confused. To reunite or not reunite, a Shakespearean tragedy in the making. She was in between acting jobs and home from London, visiting her parents. Shortly after the terrible events at the school prom in 2004, her mum and dad had received an inheritance and moved from Dalesworth to fancy Wilmslow. She'd forgotten Manchester's nip in the winter months and had let mum make her a hot water bottle to take to bed last night. Tiff rolled up her sleeves and sifted through paperwork, doing her best to focus and prepare for her next project starting in the middle of April. However, a magazine caught her attention, placed prominently on the dressing table, Tiff on the front in a sparkly dress. Her parents couldn't be prouder of the way her career... Both felt they hadn't had opportunities. Her dad had always wanted to be a jazz singer, and her mum's fantasy had been to be a member of the Top of the Pops dance troupe, Pan's People. Since the day Tiff could walk, they'd signed her up for extracurricular lessons they could barely afford. Along with her genes, Tiff had inherited their dreams. What would Tiff's old friends think of her now? She lay on her bed, turned on her Spotify playlist, 
and rolled onto her front, legs raised from the knee down, and kicking the air in time to the music, as if time had spun back nineteen years and she wasn't in her thirties. If I Ain't Got You by Alicia Keys had come on the radio one day not long after the girls split. She danced to it alone, crying in her bedroom, missing the others like crazy, realising how difficult it was going to be to shake off their friendship, laughing through tears at how the others would have raced to turn off the slushy track. Emily preferred boy band McFly on repeat, Morgan, the Killers, and Paige, her parents' favourite, the Beatles. Perhaps the newsletter message had been planted by an admirer of Tiff's career, who'd found out about her childhood club and was using it as bait to meet up, a scenario as likely as any of the other girls wanting to meet up after what Hugo did. Disgust flooded through her body. Hugo had reduced the four of them to a bunch of disloyal hypocrites. Everyone at the prom had sneered, even those pupils the secret gift society had helped. Sympathy arrived in the form of their French teacher, Mademoiselle Vachon, who'd also been their personal tutor for the entire five years of high school. She'd be in her mid-seventies now. On the quiet, they affectionately called her Miss Moo Moo, as the word vash meant cow. She'd ushered the four of them into a classroom and did her best to mediate. It lasted all of a few minutes before one by one the girls ran away, each declaring they never wanted to see the others again. To Tiff's surprise, gentle Emily had been the one who'd bolted first. Tiff sat up, head in her hands. She wouldn't recall that prom night. She wouldn't. But like a jeering member in a theatre audience, the memory she'd suppressed for most of the years since got bigger, got louder. It wouldn't go away. It was 2004, a warm June evening. The four girls had danced, holding hands, having just been to their last ever secret society meeting in the basement. But then Hugo had started talking after the track she banged. Despite everything that had happened, Tiff still loved Ricky Martin. The head had just been about to announce the prom king and queen. As the voice got louder, pupils gathered around, fascinated by his talk of the secret gift society. Tiff and Emily, Morgan and Paige, had exchanged bewildered glances, disbelief etched across their faces. Then they'd cowered, as he'd revealed far more personal secrets than the fact they'd formed a private club. A student being sick at the back of the hall had distracted supervisors from hearing the commotion Hugo was creating. He'd ended his tirade with a smirk, and the words, Don't blame me, girlies, you're the ones who'd sworn an allegiance to each other. Now everyone knows why your stupid society means nothing, like the lies it made up about me. Tiff shivered, as she remembered how Paige had dropped her drink, the glass smashing and red punch splashing up her white dress. Then Paige had turned on Morgan as soon as Hugo stopped talking. But you hate boys, she said incredulously. I assumed you were gay. Bigger laughs from the crowd and jeers of Lezzy caused angry tears to glisten. How Tiff had stared at Morgan, the only one out of the other three she'd never seen cry before. How could you know me so badly? Morgan had replied, flinching as the crowd jeered. What about you, Princess Page? According to Hugo, you've been getting very close to someone who's always mocked the very sight of us, even though their parents don't own a Porsche or go clay pigeon shooting. What a come down for a precious spoilt brat. Page's chin had trembled, and her head gave a slow, disbelieving shake in Morgan's direction. Poor little Emily, what a front you've put on. Tiff had spat. They say it's the shy ones you should watch. After what Hugo said, it's clear you're nothing but a two-faced slut. Emily had jumped, cheeks burning as the room sniggered. What makes you think you're any better than me? She whimpered. Better a phony than a fatty. It's like being friends with Jabba the Hutt. Adolf Tiff's face puckered behind her hands. 
as an image from that evening came into her head, of the crowd laughing and pointing at the four friends, of how Emily's hand had shut up to her own mouth, as if trying, too late, to stop the insult. Then, Hugo had started the chant that went on and on. Despite the teacher's protestations, all the other pupils joined in. Lezzy, Princess, Slut, Jabber. Tiff sat very still for a moment, gripped by the horror of that night in 2000. Then she sniffed and let her hands fall away. She straightened her shoulders, stood up and checked her makeup in the mirror. What did one of the girls, women now, want to gain by calling this meeting? Or perhaps it was Hugo taking the piss. Maybe the new head, Jasmine White, had left the message as a joke. At one time she was such a bitch to Tiff, shouting oink, oink, oink and getting her cronies to join in. Tiffy, sweetheart, tea's ready, hollowed up a voice. She got to her feet clenched her jaw and deleted the Dalesworth High email. Chapter 3 Morgan Morgan had hardly slept last night, her mood swinging up and down as she buzzed at the thought of meeting her old friends today and worried about Ollie, even though more than two months had passed since their big row. They'd agreed to put it behind them for the festive season. After that, Ollie had been busy with his studies. Then it had been Valentine's Day and his birthday. He hadn't wanted a party, so she'd taken him out to his favourite pizza restaurant for lunch. Her mum and dad went as well. The chat had flowed between her and Ollie, and for the first time in weeks, their usual warmth came back. He'd been looking forward to going clubbing with friends that evening, taking photos with the new phone Morgan had saved to buy him. It has been worth every hour of overtime to watch him excitedly test out his camera. A father might have taken him out for his first legal drink. Or was that some urban myth? Morgan's sleep had suffered since he turned 18. She'd wake in a panic and would creep into his bedroom and check that the human shape in bed wasn't a pile of carefully constructed cushions. The fear of him walking away, never speaking to her again hung around, and her trip to the emergency department back in October still danced in the shadows when she hit the pillows and closed her eyes. Sweat dripping bad dreams veered between Ollie leaving her or her leaving him. She couldn't wait for Paige, Emily and Tiff to meet her son. They were bound to turn up today. It has been so long. Her three friends have always been open, warm-hearted, not the types to carry a grudge for eternity. Perhaps they were parents too by now. Was Tiff an actress? Unable to settle, Morgan turned on her bedside light, rummaged around in the bottom of her wardrobe and pulled out an old shoebox. She got back under the duvet and, leaning against the headboard, sifted through the old photographs until she came to the notebook. A broad smile lit up Morgan as she mused over the sense of importance the secret gift society used to possess. On the front, in bold letters, they'd written, Top Secret Closed Cases. It was a record of their successful investigations. She flicked through. The case of the unkind Valentine card. The case of the spiked punch. The case of the stolen packed lunches. The investigations were innocent enough at first. By year 11, the content had changed, with the case of the two-timing girlfriend and the case of the online bully. Word spread and pupils in their year would ask the girls for help with their troubles. Morgan hugged her knees. On the very first day of high school, they'd been allotted the same personal tutor, Mademoiselle Vachon. They ended up sitting together every morning, despite their obvious differences, what with Morgan's practical no-nonsense attitude, Paige's understated maturity, Emily's selfless, quiet nature and Tiff's loud clumsiness. During the following years, they became aware that each of them had a particular strength that they called a gift. 
common ground was reading, and their favourite all-time books included the Amy Blyton's famous five and secret seven novels and classic Agatha Christie's. Inspiration struck after they inadvertently worked as a team to help a girl in their class find out who was stealing her stationery, and in year nine, with earnest intentions, they set up the Secret Gift Society. Morgan turned the page, and pain shot through her chest. The case of... It was Hugo's, and the investigation that had blown apart the four girls' friendship. She snapped the notebook shut, and covered it once more with photos before shoving the shoebox back in the wardrobe. She hurried into the bathroom and took a hot shower, forcing herself to sing a cheerful tune, the bad memories evaporating in the steam. The kitchen clock turned to half past nine. Dalesworth High was only a fifteen-minute walk away. Morgan hadn't told Ollie about meeting her old friends. She didn't want to get his hope up about finding his dad. But she had tried to broach the subject of starting to look a few days after he'd scared her so much. Come and sit down for a moment, she'd said when he got in from school, and she'd patted the space on the sofa next to her, moving a hammer she'd been using to put up a new bookshelf. He'd shrugged and collapsed into the armchair opposite. Trouble was, she couldn't find the words. I've decided. I'm sorry that... Ollie had stood up. I've got homework. She couldn't bring herself to tell him that she would help him find his dad, worried that he'd be crushed if they failed. Life had shown her that disappointments left a scar that never properly healed, even small ones, like how Morgan had always been ahead with maths at primary school, but then the use of calculators at Dalesworth High evened out the playing field, if only a little. Maths was the one thing in life she got completely. Instead, Morgan did try to find out more by herself. The school secretary was adamant she couldn't give out alumni details or confirm if Hugo was listed, but said if he was, she'd email and ask if he was happy for Morgan to get in touch. With a deep breath, Morgan had given the go-ahead, but it was weeks now with no comeback. She brushed her teeth and stood in front of the bathroom mirror, the narrow ledge beneath it always a mess since Ollie started shaving. The woman who stared back was a far cry from the girl last seen by Paige, Emily and Tiff. Years of looking after a child who didn't sleep well had etched black semicircles under her eyes. The short hair that used to stand defiantly upright lay limp and flat, yet high school Morgan would probably have liked the sleeveless jumper and plain shirt that she was wearing with simple straight trousers. She was still the same person underneath. Older now, wiser, okay, perhaps a little jaded. But surely the others would recognise their old friend, like she would them. Morgan pulled on her anorak and headed out the front door, leaves swirling in the wind like the butterflies in her stomach. An urge to skip almost overwhelming her, she made do with whistling. Dalesworth High had also changed since that fateful prom. The L-shaped building was now more like a U with an extra wing that housed the new library and two large computer rooms, along with an extended pastoral care centre for staff and pupils. Occasionally, over the years, Morgan turned up early for parents' evening and took a walk first, past the old basement, the still disused science lab, the hazel tree still standing proud. As if about to attend her first ever rock concert, adrenaline rushed through Morgan with every step that way. Despite the clouds, the night showers had stopped. Being outdoors always lifted her mood. When she was young, Morgan often helped her granddad, a landscape gardener, and, as she got older, he paid her to work at weekends, come rain or shine. In the summer, she'd do her homework in the back garden, and would take a walk in the local park if she needed to clear her head. Morgan passed the basement and went around the back. With her anorak sleeve, she rubbed the windows of the science lab. It was still filled with dilapidated desks and chairs, still overgrown with straggly branches. 
for a moment she was right back in 2004, holding hands with Paige, Emily and Tiff, that last time they chanted in the dingy basement, just before Hugo blew up their friendship. The clouds darkened, and she walked back around to the basement door, stopping dead by the hazel tree. Hello, Morgan. A tone crisper than it used to be. The red hair swished back into a ponytail, now hung as a sleek bob, the hint of ginger darker now. Paige still wore a blazer, but instead of being plain bottle green, it bore a Burberry check. Stomach fizzing, Morgan waved and hurried over. She'd waited so long for this moment. Paige, wow, you look great. How are you keeping? Her old friend was here. She really was, with that same mole above her lip, that same sophisticated presence no other pupil had. Castleford, did you call this meeting? She replied in a detached tone. Morgan's arms fell to her sides. Oh, but at least Paige had turned up. That had to be a good sign. Footsteps, a snapped twig. Another woman appeared, head tussled, odd socks on underneath worn jeans. Morgan grinned. Dear Emily. But a sneer crossed the new arrival's face. Morgan, Paige, which one of you called this shit show? Morgan stepped backwards. The word damn used to be Emily's worst expletive. The others teased her about it. She dug her hands into her coat pockets and crossed her fingers. Please don't let this be happening. Her heart pounded. Not guilty, Paige replied in a tone as smooth as her hair. Me neither, said a fourth woman appearing from the wooded area, the smell of strong perfume arriving before her. Morgan's eyes.